Good afternoon. I've been asked to talk about disruptive innovation, and the first thing I need to do is step away from the dais. And the second thing I need to do is to tell my friend Pramod Bhaseen not to laugh. I'd like to start this session with stories of a few ants who were sitting together and talking about their aspirations in life. One of the ants got up and said, I am very, very ambitious, and I want to be the richest ant this country has seen. The second ant said, no, I want to be the fastest growing startup ant this country has seen. The third said, oh, I want to be a real estate giant ant. And these ants were really passionate about their ambition. And in the corner of their eyes, they saw this one ant who was looking out of the window with her legs up and laughing her head off. So they turned to that ant and said, hey, Anita, why are you not participating in this important conversation of our future? She turned to them and said, because I don't want to be an ant anymore. I want to be a butterfly. The journey of disruption starts when you decide you don't want to be an ant anymore. It starts with the dream of being somebody other people think is impossible. And all the ants turned to Anita and said, impossible. What is impossible? High performance teams are those teams which do stuff others consider impossible. High performance individuals do stuff others consider impossible. How would this impossible happen if everybody is investing in incremental possibilities rather than attempting the impossible? How would disruption happen? How would change happen? How would butterflies be born if all you are thinking about is how to be a rich ant, a fast ant, a real estate ant, or a startup ant. But that's the theoretical framework. From a practical point of view, how does one think about disruption in their personal lives? I don't have an answer, but I can tell you how did I evolve my thinking through a few stories which originated in my childhood, which shaped my thinking. And then I'm going to talk about some of the disruptive experiments which I saw in my career, and then see if we can connect them. And if they inspire you to start thinking of your life as a butterfly rather than an ant. My first life lesson happened actually when I was four years old. We were playing cricket. I was in a uh, city called Nagpur. We were playing cricket with a group of friends of mine. And one of my friends hit the ball and it broke the window of my neighbor. And that guy was a scientist. His name was Chalpati Rao, Dr. Chalpati Rao. He got very angry. I went to his door because I knew him and it was my ball. I knocked on the door and says, uncle, can I have my ball back? Now, we are talking about a scenario where uh, an environment, unlike today, where everybody was allowed to hit your kid, right? Everybody was allowed, predominantly because he was doing the parents' work. So, you know, so he gave me a whack, number one. Number two, he took me inside, tied me, you know, to a chair with a rope facing the window I had broken to teach me a lesson. Now. I don't know how long that lasted, but my friends made a lot of fun of me when, I, when he untied me, after which appeared like hours, I'm sure it is a few minutes, I was sitting outside crying and howling. My mother ignored me because she said, it teaches you well, right? So if somebody else has given you the lesson, great. There was an aunt who stayed right above our house. Her name was Mrs. Anand. She saw me. She called me. My name was Mintu. She said, Mintu, come up. I went up. 
She put me on the dining table. I was standing there and he says, what happened? I cried and told her what exactly happened. And then she said, what are you going to do about it? I told her the story all over again. Then she asked me, what are you going to do about it? It was sixth or the seventh time that I started understanding that the question she is asking is different to my story. And the time I understood it, I remember it very clearly, I got down from the dining table, silently went down, picked up a brick and broke another window of my neighbor. <laughs> and then knocked on his door and says, uncle, I have already got the punishment for breaking the window, so you can't punish me again. And he was very nice. He took me inside, gave me a piece of cake, and I took the cake to my mother and told her, I told you so. But the lesson from that whole event to me was that shit happens. 50% of the time when you toss the coin, it will, it will land on the side which you don't want it to land. The question is not what you do, improving the art of tossing the coin, it is how quickly you toss it again. So your response to those events is what creates disruption. That was my first lesson. My second lesson happened when I was eight years old. We were getting transformed from Nagpur to this beautiful town called Pandagar in the foothills of Himalayas. And we were on a train. And I was this really odd character who, who liked to run off trains. Unfortunately, my mother and father and my two brothers were sleeping. The train stopped at Ratlam station. Off I went because it was a secret. Everybody is sleeping. I am on a platform. Nobody can do anything about me other than the fact that after two minutes, the train started moving out of the station. Now, the overconfidence in me at that particular time, and Pramod will tell you that nothing has changed, but I assumed that I would be able to run and catch up the train. So the train started moving. After some time, I walked to the train, tried to pull myself up, but because there was no power in the legs, when you are walking, I fell. Fear. I got up, started running behind the train, tried to get up, fell again, doubt. This time I ran faster, I tried harder, I fell harder, panic. And that is the time I had two options. Number one, to stand up there and cry and wait for somebody to help me, or run after a train which was impossible now to catch because the train was running faster than me, and there was one compartment after another compartment which was going away, even if I run behind it, but I decided to run behind an impossible train and take a chance. So while I was running this losing race, there is a vegetable vendor who was selling vegetables somewhere. She saw all this. She ran, she caught me hold all the knickers and threw me in the guard's compartment. And it's only a few years later that I told my mom that what had happened. And then she gave me a nice tight whack at that time. But the second lesson in my life is how would impossible happen if you don't chase impossible trains? How would irrational things happen when all your actions are about rationality? If you're not going to take chances which you are sure are not going to work, how will those chances work? Disruption, innovation is all about taking chances. If you're not going to take the chances, the first step of disruption has not happened. That was my second lesson. My third lesson was a little more interesting and a little more graphic, but I'm going to share it anyway, and I hope people don't put out this video, but it's an interesting lesson. So now we are in Pandagar, and uh, again, remember those days where not only your parents will allow everybody else to slap you around, but they will also often do it. And if you ask them what happened, he says, I just felt like it, right? But I was this obnoxious child who was bored very easily, so I designed this game where I would st stand on a dining table and then shout at my mother and pick up her favorite glass, and if she can come by 10, the glass will be saved, otherwise the glass will be destroyed. So she first, you know, tried to love me and explain to me that's not the game to be played. And I enjoyed it because I was getting my mother's attention, so I broke the second glass. 
Then she slapped me. I said, that is fine, I'm used to it. And I broke the third glass. Then she kept quiet. Now that means that something big was about to happen. In came my dad. And he says, what happened? She says, he broke three glasses today. So my dad looked at me and says, uh, why did you do that? He says, because it, I was getting bored and I did it. There was no repentance in my voice. Now during these days, there is a punishment which was very common, which is strip the boy, throw him out of the house. So I was stripped, other than my little underwear, and I was thrown out of the house. So I was on the porch of the house at about 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the evening, and it was very humiliating. So I did the first thing, which normally every child would do, say, sorry, I will never do it again, cry very loudly so that everybody is afraid. Obviously, my dad had seen it before. He knew me better than I knew myself and ignored it. Now the second problem really came in is what will my friends think? And one friend passed and started giggling and ran to get the other friends to see the punishment was about to be meted out and it would be a big fun. Now I had to do something disruptive to be able to protect myself from that eventuality. So as all my friends converged, I started climbing a tree. He says, what are you doing? He says, my parents have allowed me to play Tarzan. And if you go and ask your parents, your parents will not allow you to play Tarzan. My father is so good that he's allowed me to play Tarzan. So I climbed the tree and did ooh ah and all that stuff of Tarzan. Be and hold, everybody ran home, got permission to play Tarzan, and we were playing Tarzan. And then obviously my father did what he should have done. He gave me another whack. But the learning from that experience was that when there is a huge amount of disruption which happens in your life, it may be fair or unfair, your response to that has to be so unique and so disruptive that actually you are thinking out of the box and convert a threat into an opportunity. And I will show you how in my life that lesson became very, very important. The last story and the last life lesson was also very important, so I went into the school and the school was run by an American principal, Sister Laurette, God bless her, six foot six inches, very strict. It was a civics class. I think I was in class four or class five. I was very bored. As you know, I used to get bored very easily. The civics teacher was teaching. I don't think she knew what she was talking about or I so I thought. So I picked up a few marbles and started dropping on the ground when she would turn to the board. Now obviously she was a new teacher, very angry, but a couple of my friends joined me in this in this game and we had a, a good time till she started crying because she was very unhappy with what we were doing. In came the principal, caught hold of me and my friends by the ear and threw us out of the school, restigated, you will never come here again. So we said, what do we do? So if, we, if I go home and tell this, then the Tarzan will happen. I didn't want the Tarzan to happen again. So I had to do something else, so I went home, didn't tell, next day I was back in school and I was sitting in front of the gate along with two of my other friends. We were opening books and we were standing there. In the afternoon, Sister Laurette came and said, what the hell are you guys doing? I've thrown you out of the school. So we said, we have superpowers and we can hear what is happening in the class and we are following it. So you can't prevent us and we are outside the ground. I don't know what changed her mind, but she called us in and she put us back in the class. I think the question here is, the, the big lesson for me at that particular time is sometimes the chips are so down that you are thrown out of the game. But you don't have to give up. Because the door will open. Today or tomorrow the door will open. It's not that this, then a door will not open. A combination of both those four stories, and I'm sure there are stories like that in your life, created a mindset that you should always attempt something which nobody else has attempted before. And life is about doing stuff others have not done before. Because if you do stuff which others have not done before, you're attempting to be a butterfly, a failed butterfly, a dead butterfly, but you're definitely not an ant. Fast forward, I joined HCL. I was, because of whatever I did in HCL in the early days, they sent me on a Kalapani punishment posting, which was Bombay. Our market share was less than 
a fraction of a percentage, not even 1%, and I was sent here to fail. So when I entered the office, I saw a hugely demotivated office, predominantly because we have lost everything we bid. We hardly won anything. And they were, they were all unhappy with the status quo of what we have collectively achieved in the office. And they were very clear that the next time we will bid for something, we will fail. So I was racking my mind in terms of what is the problem. The customer didn't want us. The employee didn't want, think we will win, but the product looks good. So how do we change that? That is the Tarzan moment came to my mind that you know we should do something which nobody else expects us to do. So there was this shop near Churchgate called Asiatic. I don't know if it's still there. I went into that shop, bought condolence cards. I still remember I bought 50 condolence cards. I brought them, put it on the reception of the table, and I said, you hate the people you have lost orders to you so much that every time we will win, we'll personally write a condolence card and send it to that manager. So initially, people were laughing about it and not very serious. But fortunately, we won our first order. Once we won our first order, I got everybody to sign it, including the chaiwala, the lift man, the, the guard, everybody signed it, and we sent it to the regional manager. And then on the board, I, write, I wrote, one done, 49 to go. Next day, when I came to office, the environment in the office had changed completely. Everybody hated the competition so much, and it was so personal, that they wanted to send the condolence card. So disruptive innovation is not just about idea, but one small gesture can change the motivation of the team from not believing they can win to wanting to, wanting to win so much that we were very quickly the number one company in Bombay at that particular time, which was unfortunate because I was thrown out of Bombay into Bangalore to try and implement the same thing in Bangalore. So that was the first idea which, which implemented and it worked. The second idea is when I did the startup called Comnet, and there are a couple of Comnetins out here. The idea behind Comnet was that can we do disruptive innovation leveraging technology? My first startup in 1985 was a nail polish remover product, where you put your finger in, rub it, the nail polish comes off, but because I'm not a chemical student, not only the nail polish came off, a couple of other things also came off. So that time I knew that I should not ponder at trying to do something which I don't understand, not that I understand technology too much, but why don't we look at disruptive ideas around technology? So we came up with this remote infrastructure management as an idea that we can manage stuff remotely. But the bigger issue there is how do you construct a team? How do you bring Tarzans into the team which want to do something different and do it in a way nobody else has done before? So I was enamored by the story of a plumber who was called to a very rich man's house. And the rich man asked the plumber to sit down and then told the plumber of how great that plumber should feel about the fact that he is in rich man's house. And this was an 800 year old house where, you know, this is where Michelangelo sat and this is where Mahatma Gandhi delivered his first lecture and this is where Nelson Mandela came and delivered his lecture and all that stuff, the man was very proud. For one hour, this man gave John, the plumber, a huge lecture. And after one hour, he asked John, John, what do you think? And John turned to him and says, that's pretty nice, but where the hell is the leak? Most of us in the organizations are preaching to our employees of how blessed they should feel in our August company, and how blessed they should feel of the fact that they are in a great company, without telling them where the hell is the leak. So we started said that we should create a company which is all about celebrating leaks. And therefore we said we are hiring plumbers and we want people who are going to transform because we, have a, we as a company have many, many leaks. And therefore that startup which had zero revenue, had zero balance sheet and zero orders, its first deal was India's largest which was the National Stock Exchange predominantly because the Tarzans were leading it. It's not just about the disruptive idea, but also a disruptive cultures where there were Tarzans who believed that they needed to do something differently and they went beyond what anybody else was willing to do to try and win their order and then execute it in a form and shape which nobody else could have ever imagined it could be done. Fast forward to HCL technology in 2005. <clears throat> As you know, we were losing mind share, market share and talent share. And the question is how do we disrupt our business model? How do we transform ourselves? 
Our market cap was low as $1.2 billion. Right now it is about $20 billion. So how do we transform a legacy company with about 25,000 employees? And that is the time the disruptive, remember when we said in Comnet it was about remote infrastructure management as a, as a disruptive idea. Here we said we do not have ideas around the product category, right? It's the same software services, the same BPO services, the same engineering services which everybody is delivering. So there is nothing on price, product, proposition, and markets where we can do disruptive innovation, but is there an alternative axis on which disruptive innovation can be brought together? And there is where we learned from the Japanese of the fact that the Japanese were not manufacturing cars with five wheels, but manufacturing it in a different culture. So Kaizen methodology, just-in-time inventory, and a unique culture brought Japanese car makers to dominate the car industry despite manufacturing the same cars as the Americans were doing. So the question we ask is, can we disrupt our culture? And there is where we ask the three fundamental questions. What is the business we are in? And the answer was, we are in the business of creating unique experiences for our customers and deliver unique value for our customers. Question two, who creates this unique experience and delivers unique value? The answer is our employees. And hence the third and the most important question is, if the employees are the unique experience or creating the unique value, then what should the role of manager and management be? And the answer was very obvious, nothing but to enthuse, encourage, enable those employees, and hence was born the idea, employees first, customers second. So we inverted the organization management pyramid, we made the management accountable to the employees. My appraisal was done by 100,000 employees. Confidentially, the results were made public, and there were many such disruptive ideas, innovation. So with the same product, with the same pricing, with the same proposition, the clock speed of the organization improved, the condolence card kind of disruption happened, and suddenly the performance of HCL technologies went through the roof. In came recession in 2008. Everybody was psyching people. HCL is the only company which announced the fact that we will not let any HCL employee let go. The motivation levels went up. We did not see a single negative growth quarter in recession. And we outgrew all our competition, and that was the best time when we gained the maximum amount of market share. All that was good, and I come to the last disruption, which I think is the most important and uh, impactful disruption. One of the criticism which I faced to myself was the fact that whatever I have done was from a position of power, being a CEO or a startup CEO or a legacy company CEO. So the year was 2012, and Fortune Company had recently come up with their dream team, and I don't know why they nominated me in the dream team along with other people like Steve Jobs. So my head was bloated beyond recognition, and then New York Times did an article, and my head bloated beyond further recognition. And I walked up to my mother with this bloated head, which had great difficulty of entering the door, and said, look how proud your, you know, your child has made you. And she says, what happened? I explained to her what happened and, you know, was waiting for her to say something uh, like I always knew, you know, when I gave birth to you that you were born special. But she didn't say anything like that. She is a teacher, so she took a copy, English copy, she tore it in half, took that half page, wrote something on it, put it in an envelope, which was a used envelope. She only used used envelope, sealed it, and said, open it the next time you fly to New York. I said, very good, she's so nice. So I was in this Air India direct flight to New York, having my single malt, and waiting to open my mother's envelope, which would say all kinds of nice things. And then when I opened the envelope, it only said one word, and that word was enough. And I didn't know what that meant. When I landed in New York, I called her back and said, Mom, what does this mean? She says, if you don't understand it, you will understand it on your way back. <laughs> so I did understand it on a way back, and that is the time I decided that it was enough, and therefore I needed to do something very different. The reason I'm telling you this story is sometimes disruptive ideas come from others. The question is you need to listen to them. It is not necessary that you know what the right answer is, but sometimes other people tell you when enough is enough. 
So in 2012, we started a journey, a disruptive journey of working with your wife, by the way. I don't know how many of you have attempted that. And we said that we need to transform the way education is rolled out in this country. We have 144 million children in our 740,000 government schools. The learning outcome by any standards are very poor. Most of them can't count beyond 99 or construct simple sentences. But more important is 36% of them drop out of school at the age, at, by, the, by the time they reach grade five because they don't understand what is happening in the class. So therefore, on one side, we say we are young, but on the other side, we are potentially creating not only an employment problem, but an employable problem. And therefore, I decided, along with my wife, to try and see if at Sampark Foundation, we can use design thinking, collaborate with large global thinkers, especially at the Harvard Business School, and come up with disruptive ideas which would transform the education system in this country. The core idea there was that the same three questions as is HCL, what is the core business of Sampak Foundation to transform learning outcomes? Where does the learning outcome get created? In the interface of the child and the teacher. Who creates the learning outcome? The teacher. So what can we do to enable the teacher? What can we do to enthuse, encourage, enable the teacher? So we said we are going to focus on disruptive innovation in the classroom transaction between the teacher and the child in an environment where there is no electricity, no toilet, no nothing, but we were disrupted. How do we disrupt it? We were inspired by Bollywood. Can we bring Bollywood songs and dance into the class? In absence of electricity, can we use uh, an audio device with very large battery, which can last for three months? Can we use Vidya Balan, Munna Bhai MBBS voice to be able to ignite a classroom? Good morning, Mumbai, equivalent of that. Can we learn from Mary Poppins and create a Sampak Didi, which is endearing? Can we train teachers to take this device to the classroom along with other innovative teaching learning material? Can the teacher suddenly feel the love and desire of the child to learn because she has brought in a disruptive innovation and want more? So we rolled that out and the results were magical. We have 76,000 uh, schools under our program, 7 million children right now. We're taking it to 20 million children in the next two years. And the learning outcome, remember I told you that the learning outcome in grade, grade five was most people did not know how to count beyond 99. In grade two, as per the third party assessment feedback consulting done, in grade two, 76% could do two digit division and multiplication and construct simple English sentences. But the disruption happened not in the classroom. The disruption happened by an idea where we asked the children to perform, we asked seven million children to perform a play in the village square in English called My Family. This is my father, he works at the farm, he works very hard, I love my father. This is my mother, she makes very good bhindi, and I love her, and I love my sister. So this, this was an English play performed in all our schools in their village square in English, and after that, the parent participation of the school completely skyrocketed. The point and the summary of what I'm making to you all is very simple. The ideas of disruption are not big ideas. Ideas of disruptions are in your stories and in your hearts. You have to decide the day you wish to be a butterfly. Otherwise, you can spend all your life being ants and die like an ant, and nobody will notice you. It is time for all of us to think, for our country, and find our butter butterfly moments in our childhood lives. Find that person we have lost on the way. Find that spirit who wanted to do something which nobody else has wanted to do. Find that person and bring it to today. And find that, find that moment where you say enough to being an ant, and it is time that I become a butterfly. Being a butterfly is what all of us were meant to be. Go, fly, be a butterfly. Thank you.